The Second Letter of John The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us, from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. The Second Epistle of John Introduction and Commentary Second John gives us a new aspect of the Apostle, it shews him to us as the shepherd of individual souls. Whether it be addressed to a local church, or, to a Christian lady, it is for the sake of particular persons about whom he is greatly interested that he sends the letter. A. Plummer 1. Unique Place in the Canon Along with 3 John this short note is all we have of the priceless personal correspondence of one of the most beloved early saints, the Apostle John. Sometimes Christians are concerned about how open or closed they should be to others, especially to those who profess to be believers. 2 and 3 John answer this very practical question. 2 John shows the importance of keeping our house, or house church, close to heretics. 3 John encourages an open-door policy to traveling preachers and missionaries. 2. Authorship The external evidence for 2 John is weaker than for 1 John, no doubt due to its size and private nature. Irenaeus quotes it, but, like several others, thought it was part of 1 John, chapter and verse divisions came centuries later. Origen doubted the epistle, but Clement and Dionysius, both of Alexandria, quoted as John's. Cyprian specifically quotes verse 10 as by the Apostle John. The internal evidence consists of the fact that the style and vocabulary match that of the Gospel and 1 and 3 John. Even though 2 and 3 John have different beginnings from 1 John, they are so similar that few would deny that they all came from the same hand and apparently from about the same time. There is no compelling reason to doubt the traditional ascription of 2 John to the Apostle, see Introduction to 1 John for more details. 3. Date as in the case of 1 John, two general periods are possible. Either an early date, 60s, before the destruction of Jerusalem, or a late date, 85 to 90, is indicated. If the former, it would probably be from Jerusalem, if the latter, it would be from Ephesus, where the aged apostle ended his days. 4. Background and Theme The background of this epistle is the widespread ministry of itinerant preachers in the early church, still practiced somewhat in certain circles. These evangelists and ministers of the word would receive hospitality, food, and sometimes money at the Christian homes and congregations they visited. Unfortunately, false teachers and religious charlatans were quick to step in and use this custom as a means for easy gain and to spread their heresies, such as Gnosticism, see Introduction to 1 John. If it was important in the first century to warn of heretics and religious profiteers, what would the Apostle John say if he could see today's patchwork quilt of sects, cults, and false religions? The central theme of 2 John is that we should give no cooperation whatever to a person who is spreading error regarding the person of our Lord, verses 10, 11. Commentary 
1. The Apostle's Salutation, Grace, Mercy, and Peace, verses 1 to 3. V. Verse 1. In 2 John, the Apostle introduces himself as the Elder. This may refer to age or official position in the church. As to age, John was the last of the apostles who had accompanied with the Lord Jesus. As to official position, he surely was a bishop or overseer. Thus, we need not choose our explanation, both are correct. The expression to the elect lady is not so easy to explain. Three views are commonly held. 1. Some believe that the elect lady is the church elsewhere referred to as the Bride of Christ, or a particular local church. 2. Others think that the letter was addressed to the elect Kyria, her name being Kyria. This name could be the Greek equivalent to the Aramaic name Martha, both mean lady. Point 1. 3. Others feel that John is writing to an unnamed Christian lady, who with all other believers is among the elect of God chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. We prefer the last view and feel it is especially significant that this warning against anti-Christian teachers should be found in a letter addressed to a woman. Sin first entered the world through Eve's being deceived by Satan. The woman being deceived fell into transgression, 1 Timothy 2 verse 14. Paul speaks of false teachers who make a special appeal to women, they get into the house and capture gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, who will listen to anyone and yet are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, 2 Timothy 3 verses 6 and 7. Even today the false cults visit homes during the daytime, when the man of the house is usually at work. Children need to be warned against false teachers also. John states that he loves the select lady and her children, in truth. Those who were saved find themselves in a wonderful fellowship, loving others whom they never would have loved, were it not for their common love for the truth of God. It is God's truth that binds hearts together, the hearts of all those who have known the truth. Verse 2. Because of the truth has two possible explanations. It may refer to the motive for loving all the saints, or it may give John's reason for writing this letter. Both are valid meanings. The truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Here the truth may refer to, 1. The Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am, the truth, John 14 verse 6, 2, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is truth, 1 John 5 verse 6, see John 14 verses 16 and 17, or, 3, the Bible. Your word is truth, John 17 verse 17. Should we not pause to marvel at our being sustained by these three, and their being with us forever? Verse 3. John's greeting is grace, mercy, and peace will be with you, Two grace is undeserved favor to those who deserve the opposite. Mercy is pity shown to those who are guilty and wretched. Peace is the harmonious relationship that results from God's grace and mercy. All three of these blessings are from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father is the source and the Son is the channel. In addition, they are in truth and love, and never at the expense of either of these virtues. 2. The Apostles' J.O.I., Obedient Children, verse 4. Now John expresses his joy at hearing that some of the children of the elect lady were walking in truth. The truth is not just something to be believed with the mind, but something to be lived out in everyday behavior. Just as the Lord Jesus was the living embodiment of truth, so he expects our lives to be testimonies to the truth. 3 of the Apostles' Charge, T.O. Walk in Love, verses 5, 6. Verse 5. In verses 5 through 9, the Apostle seems to give a short summary of his first epistle. There he listed the tests of life. Now in these verses, he repeats at least three of them, the test of love, V5, the test of obedience, V6, and the test of doctrine, verses 7 to 9. Verse 6. First, he reminds his readers of the commandment to love their fellow believers. Love here is essentially the unselfish giving of oneself for the benefit of others. It is not what can I get out of that person, but what can I do for that person? Then, love is shown to be a walking according to his commandments. We cannot truly love, in the divine sense, unless we are walking in obedience to the Lord and to the truth of God. For, the Apostles' concern, Antichrist Deceivers, verses 7 to 11. Verse 7. This brings us to the test of doctrine. The great question is, did God really become man in the person of Jesus Christ? The answer is a resounding yes. 
The Gnostics three believed that the divine Christ came upon Jesus of Nazareth for a period of time. But John insists that Jesus Christ was, is, and always will be God. Verse 8. Therefore, he warns his readers, look to yourselves, that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. In other words, stand firm in the truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ so that our labor among you will not have been in vain, and so that we, the apostles and their followers, will receive a full reward. Verse 9. When John says, whoever transgresses for and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, he is speaking of false teachers. To transgress is to go beyond the allowed bounds. That is what the cults do, they claim to have new light and teach doctrines that God has not revealed in his word. They do not stay within the bounds of the Christian revelation or abide in the doctrine of Christ, probably meaning the teachings which Christ himself brought. It could also mean all that the Bible teaches about Christ. The apostle emphasizes in verse 9 that a cultist may claim to know God, but if he does not believe in the absolute deity and humanity of the Lord Jesus, he does not have God at all. God can only be known through his Son. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14 verse 6. Verses 10, 11. This is the heart of the epistle. It gives us valued advice on how to deal with false teachers who come to our doors. John does not refer to casual visitors but to anti-Christian propagandists. Should we invite them in? Give them a cup of coffee? Help them financially? Buy their literature? The answer is that we should not receive them or greet them. These people are enemies of Christ. To show them hospitality is to take sides with those who are against our Savior. It is possible that sometime we might let such a person into our house without knowing that he denies the Lord. These verses would not apply in such a case. But when we do know a man to be a false teacher, it would be disloyal to Christ to befriend him. These verses do not apply to visitors, generally. We often have unbelievers as guests in an effort to win them to Christ. But here it is a question of religious teachers who deny the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. C. F. Hogg explains. Nothing should be done to give the impression that the offense against Christ is a matter of no great moment, or to put the delinquent in the way of influencing others. Point 5. V. The Apostles' Hope, A Personal Visit, verses 12, 13. Verse 12. John would have liked to say more to the elect lady. But he stops writing at this point in the hope of an early personal visit when he can speak face to face. How much more satisfactory it is to talk in personal encounter than to write with paper and ink. And how much more wonderful it will be to see the Savior face to face than to see him by the eyes of faith, as at present. Truly then our joy will be full. Verse 13. So John closes, the children of your elect sister greet you. We do not know who they were but we shall meet them someday and enjoy fellowship with them and with the beloved Apostle John who penned this letter, and best of all with the Savior himself. Amen.